in, in Samui. He actually worked with um, Mosquitia Indian divers in it's Honduras. Um, and he was teaching them to, to dive because these guys, they were doing the, the, the sort of shell diving and, and, and shellfish and stuff, but they were getting, as it was getting depleted, they would end up going deeper and deeper. And a lot of these, they weren't trained divers. So it's just coming out. They'd spend ages underwater and then just come out and they get really serious cases of decompression illness. And Bob was telling me some of these guys were, were quite seriously ill and some of them like were, you know, the bends can actually paralyze you, it can kill you. Um, and, and he was sort of telling me how, you know, these guys would get up and, and a lot of, you know, they would have some shaman and that and say, we know how to cure you. And they're putting out cigarettes on his back and stuff. Griff, how are you, brother? All good, Chris. Good to, <laughs> mate. Good, good to see you, mate. Yes, it's wonderful to be in touch. Um, I'm just trying to recall. I remember you emailed me. But was it was it after seeing somebody on the podcast that you knew or or you had an affiliation with? Yeah, I saw um, I saw one of your podcasts. You had one of the guys that was I think he was living in Thailand at the time, um, and he was Richie sort of Maybank. explaining it. Yeah, be, being the sort of the expat thing, and I yeah I've been there, seen that, and done the, got the t shirt sort of thing. Uh, and that's when I was all yeah it brought back some some great memories and obviously some not so great memories. Um, uh, but but yeah, that was that was that was the, the why I got in touch. Yeah. Yeah, and just to clarify, Griff, where do you live now? Are you in, are you back in the UK? I'm, I'm back in the UK. I came back. To, I I I actually was out. In, I long story short, uh, just a shy of ten years in the the, the army. I was engineers. Uh, got out in '97 and wanted to do the backpacker thing. Did that and I ended up in Thailand. Uh, and I stayed in Thailand for six years. Um, first as a diving instructor, uh, and then I ended up working in, in healthcare, in the uh, uh, treating divers that had bends, and then also uh, evacuating people uh, that had been injured and hurt in the various island group in, in around Koh Samui mm. in Thailand. Um, and I got back to the UK and I carried on, I basically stayed doing the same job, I just did it in the UK for about another 15 years. Uh, working in, in chambers and healthcare and, and that in the UK. But I got back in 2005. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. got you. Yeah. So just to lay my sort of table out and for, for, for our friends watching, mm. diving, I can imagine people see a podcast and it's about scuba diving, like, mm. like let's just say, essentially. I'm thinking, oh, that's not my thing. I don't do that. I won't watch mm. that, right? But the reason I'm fascinated to have this chat with you is diving is just so much more than diving. Mm. It, there's so many offshoots of that, oh, that pastime. I'm not going to call it a sport because there's obviously many different types of diving. Mm. It, it goes in obviously to the, it relates to the British forces on a, on an R and R level. So a recreational level, but mm. also on the, on the, professional like the sbs yeah. the the engineers obviously the ships, navy clearance yeah ships divers all, all this kind of thing yeah then of course you've got the fascinating history of scuba diving itself with jack cousteau who invented yeah. the, the was it called the aqua lung i think they they they, they called it yeah he, he he was the one that he invented scuba that yeah guy. Uh, he actually invented scuba um, uh, and and, he, and he, the history of it. Funny enough, there's a, a guy. Uh, there's actually a, a, a museum of diving in, in Portsmouth. Uh, I actually I actually know the uh, one of the curators of the, the uh, historical diving society. Um, and and it is it's pretty pretty impressive the, the way we go back to diving. And, and you know, we're saying the history of diving. You know, it's a one jab in the eye, I suppose, for the for the Matlows in the Navy is the first divers were, were not Navy divers. The first divers were the Royal Engineers. Um, and, and, and it's progressed through uh, and, and yeah, it, it's gone. And, and then obviously in around the sort of, you know, fifties and sixties, it became a, a recreation and it's got bigger and bigger um, globally. And we've now got, you know, organizations around the world, such as the British Sub Aqua Club, the Professional Association of Diving Instructors, but it's now moved on and, and it's getting 
more and more sophisticated and we're seeing certain things that you never saw in the civilian light now being used in the civilian site so things like rebreather diving mm. um you know closed circuit rebreathers were you know uh, the, the the reserve of the military we're now seeing that they're you know common as, as anything nowadays a lot of people do like to do rebreather diving um we're seeing extreme depths being reached on scuba you know my personal opinion working in the, the nastier side of it and work, working with diving accidents is I, i'm not sure that scuba dive, diving or the scuba equipment is 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 the right set of equipment to go to some of the depths that these people do but you know people have gone a thousand feet down in in, in scuba um mm. you know um, and you know sometimes it's it's gone quite seriously wrong and they've never come back others have got back and they've, they've suffered very severe bends decompression mm. sickness um but yeah it's 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 got bigger and bigger and i'm sure this <coughs> covid thing's probably giving it a bit of a hit but i, I was working as a diving instructor um at at the time of 9 11 and, and 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 we took a hit from that but it, it always bounces back it's a it is a it is a sport that people well, i say it's a sport it's it's you're, you're right it's, it's a pastime um it's you know it's no it's no racing or anything like that um but yeah it's 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 a fantastic uh pastime I mean, you really can um go from zero to hero it's one of those things it is it is achievable and i you know i ended up as an instructor in one of the busiest diving training areas in the world probably um but yeah it's, it's it's great sport yeah and the other two kind of offshoots i wanted to mention is the enormous number or certainly back in the 90s when the the north sea oil platforms yeah relied <laughs> on divers to go down and do the engineering mm. now a lot of it's done by robots right or these, oh, these, yeah. these am robots on mm. umbilical cords but there was a huge amount of Marines would leave and become saturation yeah. divers. Yeah. And the other area it goes into as well is obviously traveling. Yeah. Um, I'd imagine an enormous amount of people go backpacking and end up doing their first scuba dive and then getting into it yeah. and <clears throat> getting to dive master and then taking people out. Yeah. And take, take it all yeah, absolutely. I think it does. I think the, the, the big thing, like I say, probably the, the, the key time in, in uh, diving for offshore, what we, what we call commercial diving, which is a completely different training regime uh, and everything. Um, the, the probably heyday was probably the 80s uh, going into the 90s. Um, but back in the 70s, it was it was an extremely hazardous profession to give you an idea. Um, it was cheaper to insure an astronaut than it was a North Sea diver. It was that hazardous. Um, but it, it was one of these things that um, <clears throat> the amount of money that these guys could earn. And when we go back, I did my diving medics course with a bunch of guys that were working in Saturn offshore. And a lot of them were ex-Navy. Uh, a lot of them were ex-Army. Uh, um, a lot of them, you know, family trade. Um, and you can see the... The, the, the draw was the money. They could earn huge sums of money. I mean, you know, back then a, a day in, you know, per day in sat, they were on sort of seven, eight hundred pounds a day. Uh, huge sums of money, um, you know, and, and they'll be the first to tell you. The idea was is for every day you're in saturation. And for those guys that don't know what that is, is basically you live in a chamber that's pressurized to the same depth as the the, the sea is where you're working you go in a little uh, uh um another little chamber uh at, which takes you back to basically like a lift to to and from the workplace so you, you're not constantly decompressing you're just that one shame uh, pressure and uh the idea is is for every day like that you do 30 days of that you don't need to do too many of them per year but what a lot of them would do they they would work in the british sector have a logbook for the british sector and then they'd have another logbook for the norwegian sector because for every day you were in saturation, you had to have a day off. So if you did 30 days, you could work for 30 days. So mm. I had two log books, you know, one, one for Norway, one, one for, for Britain. And a lot of them would, would obviously work in, in the Gulf was, was another place uh, that a lot of them worked for. I think they got paid a lot less uh, for that. Um, but we used to get a lot of them, a lot of them lived in Thailand. So we got to, to meet quite a few of them, uh, you know, and, and funny enough, you know, these were the guys that, 
they didn't want to go recreational diving. <laughs> no, it's not for me. Uh, I do it for, for work. I don't really want to sort of uh, do it do it for fun. But you know, others I'm, I'm sure they do. Uh, there are one or two you do it. They are it's big for them. Um, but I was always amazed at you know, and I could understand it. A lot of them they didn't, weren't really interested in doing the the the, the recreational side of it as, as we call it. Um, but but some went all the way and, and, and became instructors and been the the the, the, the commercial side and went. Do you know what? I'm just just doing that. Yeah. yeah and um another another couple of things that comes into my mind is i've actually met treasure hunters <clears throat> you know it's very yeah. big very big in florida i think they call it the treasure coast yep uh, all the all the sort of spanish galleons that sunk sunk there on their way back from the spanish main mm -hmm. um and i've also met several shell divers who dive for the for clams because the, yeah. the price of a clam is so expensive yeah. I've, seen, I've met them up in norway um yeah. i've been in a pub with them and they've been shivering because they, <laughs> you know it, it can make you cold for quite a long time can't it the, yeah oh oh yeah don't care. even in really what you'd say warm weather warm tropical seas um it, it can really i remember teaching one lad to dive and we had to get him out of the pool because he's he he was so cold, you could see it. Bless his heart. He was only like 14, but he was so keen to, to learn and he was just getting too cold. And we just said, <clears throat> let's get out, warm up, you'll feel better. And then he went, it, 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 are my lips blue? And I went, well, no. And he said, well, can we wait until my lips are blue? I said, well, that's probably a bad thing. So let's get out and just, just warm up for a bit and then we'll, we'll, we'll carry on. But yeah, you, you can get quite cold quite quite quickly one of the guys we had working great guy ex-vietnam uh ex, ex air force vietnam veteran from the u.s guy called bob armington in in samui he actually worked with um mosquito indian divers in i think it's honduras um and he was teaching them to to dive because these guys they were doing the the, the sort of shell diving and, and, and shellfish and stuff but they were getting as it was getting depleted, they would end up going deeper and deeper. And a lot of these, they weren't trained divers. So it's just coming out. They'd spend ages underwater and then just come out and they get really serious cases of decompression illness. And Bob was telling me some of these guys were, were quite seriously ill and some of them like were, you know, the, the bends can actually paralyze you, it can kill you. Um, and, and he was sort of telling me how, you know, these guys would get up and, and a lot of, you know, they would have some shaman and that and say, we know how to cure you and they're putting out cigarettes on his back and such like and 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 you know bob armington was, was telling me how he you know he put together a package just for these guys and he said we weren't teaching them to be the greatest divers in the world. we were just teaching them enough so they wouldn't come up and 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 and, and cop a really bad bend um but yeah it's it, it's you know the old shellfish stuff right you can you can see it yeah i'll i've dived off honduras i think utila is off yeah. Hon, Hon, Honduras or Honduras um, and one of the things I came across was local divers yeah they had the umbilical air you know going yeah. up to the boat yeah surface and, applied yeah and that's what it is and you and I would learn all the paddy or or, be yeah, or, or, breeze out or whatever it is you know, yeah all these stringent regulations to keep us safe time on you know bottom time decompression time all this yeah all that sort of stuff these guys yeah. don't know any of that they just go, just down. go in come in come up yeah. yeah yeah it's 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 an interesting sort of sort of way and it's sad as well because you're like it's it's just ignorance isn't it um uh you know but you know you you, you know you and it's like say so you meet these great guys and you know I met bob and he was explaining how he did this and he was a former commercial diver back in the day when it was all standard dress and everything else so he's got some great photographs of that but you, you know he explains these stories uh, and you sort of like you know wow as, as you see this and, and you do the one thing I, I took away obviously I, I worked as a diamond instructor and it was extremely busy for the time I was there you know we would quite happily be doing it was a full-time job um, whereas <clears throat> a lot of time instructors say in the UK and that they're not it's not full of them have it as a full-time job but it's not like they're they're treating they're teaching sort of 10 people at a time and that were in in Samui and certainly in Koh Tao it was called the open water farm 
um, because you know all their instructors were on the maximum limit, which is eight, and, and then you could have another two if you got a dive master with you. Um, <clears throat> so it was, really was quite full on, and, and you did start seeing a few people that were sort of pushing the rules a little bit, and maybe probably shouldn't be be diving um, either purely because it just wasn't in their mindset to do it, um, and and or or you could see that you know what this this just outright you know medically you shouldn't be doing this um you know and it can go wrong yes yes it's interesting and there's also a noticeable difference between when you dive as a qualified diver and when you <coughs> go out on a training dive so your training dive you've got your dive instructor and your dive yeah. masters so basically you you kind of looked after as much yeah. as as much as possible but i dived once on the great barrier reef in, in um, australia and i'll tell you what they couldn't throw us off that boat fast enough it was quite clear they wanted yeah. us in the water get out let's go home yeah that's horrible when you meet that i i found that in um you, you in the red sea not not I want to know, I've, I, let me rephrase, certain boats you went on in, in the Red Sea, I, I really got the impression that, you know, the, 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 that some of the instructors, and I think a lot of them, if I'm honest, they were sort of technical divers, which is a bit more, uh, it's a one up from, from your standard sort of diver, if you like. And, and they, you could see their heart wasn't in it and they just wanted to go home. Um, they just wanted to get in the water. There you go, swim around, right, we're getting out. Um, and I remember, once diving off a place called Thomas Reef. And I, I swear to God, it looked like the water was boiling. There was that many bubbles there. And there was so many divers. And in the end, I remember we we come across and, and I'm just following the ice disc guy, losing the will to live because it was just come along everyone, follow me sort of thing underwater. And then another group come from the other side. And I swear to God, all I could think of, it, it looks like Thunderball. There was all these divers coming across each other. And it was just, my God, uh, you know, and, and you, know, you, you sometimes think there's a lot of people pay some really big money for this. And I understand it's, it's a great, you know, if, you, if anyone ever wants to go dive, the Red Sea is fantastic. But sometimes you do think, you know what, sometimes the guys just put that little bit more effort in and look like you're, you know, you're enjoying it and, and, and people will enjoy it themselves. Um, but on the flip side, I also met a couple of fantastic instructors out there. I really did that, that really made it worthwhile they made the entire you know every, every dive was a joy and I think that's a that's part of the skill I think of, of being a, a recreational diving professional whether you're a dive master or, or, or instructor you've got to realize is you know the people that go there are not you know special forces rebreather divers they're not we're not going to go and stick limpet mines on battleships we're not going to go and drill for oil we're just going to bubble around and just have fun and enjoy it Mm. Um, and I think some of them do do tend to to forget that from time to time, um, but you know, others don't. And and you meet, there's some great people in the industry who really are, um, you know, and they've all got experiences and such. And you meet so many different people uh, across the board. Um, I mean, <clears throat> you, you we we had one of our instructors, uh, Birgit. She's from, and that's one of the things that you do like. I did love about it. I mean, second to being in the army, I'd say it was one of the best jobs we've ever had, being a diving instructor working on the boats. Absolutely loved it. And, uh, you know, you literally, you know, and people sort of say to me there, you know, so wh where, where did you used to work? I was, well, have you seen the movie The Beach? You know, yeah, well, there. That, 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 that literally, not the, the books are the real one, because it was over the other side uh, where it was set. Um, but you got to meet so many different people and from all over the world and all different walks of life. And I remember one of the guys, uh, the Birgit, one of the instructors that we had over there, she was, um, she was a cracking instructor, but she only did like half the year. The other half the year, in the, the sort of winter months, she went back to Austria as a skiing instructor. And it's like, you know, when do you meet people like this? It's just fantastic. What a life to have, you know, you know six months teaching skiing, six months teaching diving. It's absolutely superb to meet all these Yeah, I, I, met, I met a surfer <laughs> in... Uh... Nicarag I think we're in Nicaragua mm. and we hitchhiked out to this surf beach and people were just like camping on the beach. I think there was one cabana there, you know, like mm. 
rustic backpackers <laughs> and and this guy he just he washed dishes in Europe in the winter so he could just mm. snow snowboard he said Chris you rock up in the morning you wash your dishes for an hour and a half then you get the day off you've got to go back in the evening he, yeah. said, he said you all get a free because your staff in the resort you all get a free lift mm. pass and he snowboard all winter and then he surf all summer i mean what's not to love about that <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely it's part of the old, the old sort of uh, lifestyle that, that, that you do get it's um it's one of those sorts of things that you'll always remember some of these these characters that you bump into uh, across the board i always remember talking of things like that. we we met a very good 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 guy um came work us when we were at um working in a chamber uh in in samui uh guy from um, serbia Karto, luba and he chats away and really well spoken and everything else and he said well you know I'm, I'm learning to be a dive master and hopefully I'll, I'll become a diving instructor so i can you know get a good job and earn good money and i said what, what is it you did back in europe he said i'm a doctor a doctor of what he said, medicine i was like what on earth are you doing? He was just saying, where, where I am is just not worth being a doctor. So he just binned it and, and went out to, to, to Kotal Co and, and, and did it there. And, and he, another, what a great guy, uh, you know, took it upon himself to learn Thai. And he learned Thai fluently uh, in, in something like four months. And I was just blown away by how intelligent this guy was. And he, loveliest fella you'll ever meet uh, mm -hmm. and, and you know and of course the thing was he was a doctor so he was not an idiot he was not thick he was super bright you know uh, but you, you couldn't help but go wow you've just come to be a diving instructor sort of thing um fantastic sort of stuff yeah did 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 love it yeah yeah i'm i'm very fortunate really i think i've dived in many places around the world yeah. now um I'll tell you a funny story though. I, I first started scuba diving in the Marines. Yeah. One yeah, of the luck, yeah. lucky things about the forces is they paid for it all. Yeah. We were trained by Navy divers and, and it was all done through BZAC. Yeah. I, I mean, I say to me, I did their engineers. I was junior leaders in Dover and my first diving, proper diving, was off the Isle of Man. Uh, you know, we did an expert there. Great fun. Uh, that's where I, and, you know, who, who would have known that years later that I've got the opportunity to to, to go away and become a, an instructor in it, um, you know. And I think it's it, it's a real eye opener that you get to see some fantastic stuff, uh, you know. And I always remember taking a guy, we took a, a student diving, and I'll never forget this. First dive, I took this guy out, he opened water one, took him out, and I said, right, the, the big thing about the first open water dive, doing the paddy system, the first open water dive is... We just want you to go diving. You're not going to go really deep. You're not going to do any skills or anything. We just want you to go dive. If we do skills, we'll do them on the surface. But it's just, this is your, like an introductory dive. We're just going to, that's it. Uh, we took this guy and we drummed him in the water and it was a place called Sail Rock. It was crystal clear. It was gin clear. You could see the bottom 40 meters down. And we're sort of swimming around looking for bits and pieces. And then lo and behold, well, biggest whale shark swims past and of course everyone tries to keep up with it and you're not going to do it you know you see these things you know, in the, the, the nature programs and whatever else and it's sort of all gliding along with a lovely slow tail you try keeping up with that thing that thing's motoring i tell you and uh, this this guy sort of swim around and he was like oh you know always like, what do you think of that that was superb and, yeah yeah it was great and all i could think of is well, your first ever dive, you see a, probably the largest whale shark out there. Pretty much all downhill from now, mate, you know what I mean? You, you've, you've topped out early. Um, but, you know, it, it was one of those things, that's the beauty of, of it. You never know really what you're going to come across uh, when you're underwater. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a hundred quid <laughs> if you can guess what the first animal I saw on my very first dive was. And we're talking underwater now. We're a bang on. We're a bang. That could, that could oh, be. Where else were you? We're we're uh, Bova Sand in Plymouth. Oh, so Bova Bova Sand Bova. Port. It's February. <laughs> you can see something out there. And we're in wetsuits, right? Yeah. Although I will say, <laughs> yeah. back back when you're young, these 
they weren't even five mil. I think they were well thicker than that. They they did the, the job. The old ru- proper rubber looking thing as well. Yeah. yeah. Like the you Mitch- have a bog seat on the ABLJ. Yeah. Like oh, a like Mich- Michelin man. But um, yeah. <laughs> we went out. It was such murky conditions that, yeah. and I've never done this before. I'm not saying this is normal, but we were mm. roped to the dive instructor. <laughs> Me and another boot neck with yeah. the, the matlow in the middle. And we were roped together just so no one got lost. Yeah. And we sunk below the surface, started thinning out. And all three of us, I'm guessing everyone reacted. We just stopped because there's this animal swimming underwater <laughs> towards us. I'll give you a hundred pounds if you can guess what it was. If you tell me it's a cat or something like that. <laughs> oh, you're very close. It's a rabbit. A rabbit. <laughs> a rabbit, right? And so what obviously it had fallen off the cliff and drowned. Yeah. But underwater, it was moving like this. Yeah, it looks paws, like it's swimming. Its paws were going. And the three of us just we went under, started thinning, and the three of us just went. We all just stood up again. And the dive master <laughs> put his hand out and lifted it and went, it's a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> some great stuff you, you, you things you find uh, underwater i remember the first one i my my old boss told me the story uh harry was swimming back to the boat and he said we're just going to swim along the bottom and he's swimming back to the boat and then like he come across this, this this little wreck of a boat this is great isn't it hang on it's the half look like our boat <laughs> no. the boat had sunk when it got out <laughs> <laughs> something had gone wrong and there was a fire on board or something they'd gone out and the boat had just sunk and he's gone oh look we found a new wreck he didn't realize it was our own boat <laughs> griff we were you out there for the tsunami then i actually got back see that's just the interesting thing because i got back um to the uk what was because sorry but boxing day 04 and i was back in the uk for that time i was actually in the uk at the time but still, obviously, we had, you know, we still had a lot of friends and that. And I knew the guys at, um, at the, the hyperbaric chamber in Phuket. Uh, and we were speaking to them, guy, we, you know, we rung them up. As soon as it happened, we rang up, you guys okay? Um, you know, and they said, and you could hear it in the background. Everyone's a, a, a bit sort of panicked and whatever else. And I, I remember they were saying, everyone is going to the beach now to try and see if they can help. And... Um, I don't know anything about tsunamis like most people didn't at the time, but then it just come on the BBC news that, you know, it said, look, you know what, it's literally just happened. And the worry is that, you know, you, you can have more, it's never just one, there's more of them. And this guy saying, you know, there'll probably be more. And I remember saying on the phone to this, 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 this secretary at the time, I, said, I, I don't think that's a good idea. I think you should probably get away from the beach for a while. You know, because because there's one thing I remember that happened is it, it was on the news incredibly quickly. Um, because we were, uh, you know, I remember it was quite like you know, quite late in the day, if I remember right, or it was early in the morning, I can't remember what it was, but I remember I was actually up uh, and it came on the, the late news or something. Uh, and I remember sort of bloody hell, we're gonna have to give them a call. And they, they were they were all right, but interestingly enough, that that doctor who we were talking about, he was over in in Kalak at the time. And, and I said, so what, what was you doing? He, he, he was saying that he just spent most of the day just picking bodies up. And he actually was the guy that resuscitated or attempted to resuscitate the king's, I think it was the king's grandson or something like that. Unfortunately, he passed away. Um, but he, he actually tried, he, he did, he ended up doing CPR on him for that. Uh, and I know that a lot of, a lot of the divers were, were brought in, just rec- recreational divers to, to, to sort of recover bodies and things like that, um, which is, you know, it, it's one of these things where I know people can go, yeah, we'll go and do this. But from my experience, you know, I, I've always said to them, you know, try to keep away from that because it's not really what you do. You're not, you're a, you're a, you're a recreational diver and you do get, people can get a bit overexcited. We had a, there's a wreck off, off Kotal called the Unicorn and it's, and at the time, we this is before then, they, you know, it was used for technical diving because it's quite deep. So they'd go and do technical diving. And um, 
there was a guy that he just finished his um this is a paddy had just brought out their, their deep tech diver air diver and he just finished his course so he arranged to go out and do a, a, a tech dive on, on the unicorn with a, a buddy and apparently on the a uh, uh, guy called a uh, really great guy who knows the area well gary hawks who was our dmc on the island said that um you know we the guy's gone in through a hole that we just say just don't ever go in and he's gone in and he's he's got stuck and his buddies had to come up and leave him there and, and, and as he's coming up he's seeing his his, his bubbles rise uh, uh up uh through the ascent line um uh, and and until they stopped which you know you think that's a horrible thing to to think you, you know he's you know, literally the moment you, you you may not see him but you know the moment he, he was over um and after that happened we people get because we were we by that time we'd sorted out the injured diver evacuation service and everything else so people were sort of we were the first port call people would ask us what we're going to do about it and whatever else and um, we just said look you know we'll we'll speak to the police which we did and they said well we can't do anything about it it will be down to the navy and the navy said you know you Generally speaking, we wouldn't look to do that, but I believe later on they did. Um, and when we reported back, a lot of guys on the island, on Kotel, the rock as it's called, um, were, were saying, you know, maybe we'll go in and, and get him out. And it was, I remember Gary was saying that a guy turned up at the, the DMC station uh, saying, you know, you know, we've got a dive master here. He's, he's quite small. We think he can get in there and pull this guy out. And you're like, you're a dive master you're not a you know you may have gone and done a a rescue dive of course but this this is something different this is not what you're you're trained to do and the the risk is enormous and you could probably get in there and get stuck but even if you if you do you know you're going to pull this guy out that's a it's one heck of a job to do uh, in its own right and it's not we you know so we just said we, we wouldn't advise it at all it's you know i know you may think you can do it but always remember i think it's probably something being x forces you sort of saw the line you saw how it was because everyone that works in that chamber uh, uh, on samui we, we really was an x forces lot um we you know we was um me rob rob arlington was a uh, guy chris espin uh, x remy uh, it was dave covey and bobby keen all two x infantry guys um you know so we sort of knew we put that military way of thinking towards things um and you know the military way of thinking is is you're you're taught how to do something to the point where that is it and then at that point someone else will take over and do it because it's not your job um and and i think you know that the the, the the recreational guys that the dive masters at the time i think they've you know it's a great title dive master maybe it makes me a little bit invincible and it was just like it isn't worth it. I know you've got your tech ticket and all this sort of stuff, but it's it's not what you do. Um, it's very highly specialised. Um, and one of the guys that worked with us, um, also Ben Remnants, uh, really well-known cave diver as well, which is another very um, um, uh, uh, high-end and specialised type of diving. And I must admit, not for me, um, but, but Ben was actually roped in to help out with the rescue of the school kids. In, yeah, in, in I, was gonna, I was going to come on to that. Um, before we do, though, we we had a situation down in Antarctica. Yeah, I don't know if you might have heard me mention this in one of my other podcasts, but the one of the girls in my dive team drowned on our on our very first dive. Yeah, and it was it was like the other side of the coin. There was no communication, mm. right? No. We just heard the, the Gemini revving its engine, so the distress signal, right? So you 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 got a surface. Mm. We didn't have to decompress because it was only we we're only in like five mm. meters, and I think we'd only been down like 10 or 15 minutes or something, right? Um and so I get up and hand my kit off to the guy in the boat of the wasn't even like, like really like a they're not really dive masters there. Yeah, they're slightly like, different. Isn't it? They're like the tour guide, but they're yeah. they're, they're they're a diving mm. instructor trained, and they're Gemini yeah. trained, and yeah, all this kind of stuff, right? Anyway, so I had my kit off, got in the boat. My dive partner, mm. Aussie chap Matt, hello mate, yeah. um, was already in the boat. I'm like Matt, what what 
what's going on? I, I was I just, there was no communication, mm. right? And it was only then that he points at the Japanese chat and went, it's him. His partner's gone missing. And I was mm. like, oh, nothing worse. Well, oh, yeah. one sec, mate. <laughs> yeah. So I think you should mention I, Antarctica. I had just seen this girl though, Griff, right? I mean, I literally, yeah. I was kissing up next to her on the boat. I saw her yeah. go in. I started to see them struggle, blah, blah, blah. But my point is, they pulled all the divers out of the water. And we're only in five yeah. meters. Yeah. Took us all back to the expedition ship. Yeah. Then we stood there on the on the quarter deck thing in my jig, looking at the, you know, the the Gemini, which is still mm. one of the Gemini's was still out there, and people are going, I "Hope she's all right." And you're like, "She's not all right. She's she's dead. She's been underwater like twenty minutes now, right?" Yeah. You know, sorry to break it to you, but this girl ain't coming back. And then it was like 50 minutes before they got the rescue diver in the Gemini to go back out yeah. there. And this, I mean, there's no disrespect at all. Yeah. But the rescue diver was like a 21 year old yeah. uh, uh, biology student, right? Yeah. And no disrespect to her. I'm sure her diving was much better than mine, but you had me in a boat and I'm a rescue because I did bees out. You do the rescue yeah. diver bit. Mm. You had one chap who was a cave diver. Yeah. So he's used to going down with all the, the special gases and air yeah, and, and all that sort of stuff, and, you know, squeezing through gaps like this. And that's what he yeah. did. The other guy, uh, Lynn owned his own dive shop, right? Yeah. Did all this experience in the boat. And they send out the, the, the snorkel kid yeah. and rather than say right guys just chuck your snorkels in and see if you can find her you know just get rid just just snorkel right and this is not I, I i'm not i'm not criticizing anyone i'm just saying it for the sake because we're yeah. having this conversation griff it's it's easy in hindsight but yeah. it was a little bit like oh something serious has happened let's get the kids out the way We'll we'll do, and it was like no weird. Like yeah, it's not what you do, you know. Yeah. And, I mean, it's very similar because uh, first thing I was going to say on, on Antarctica. When I came back to the UK, we treated a diver in in London, and and she had come from um, um, Baz British Antarctic Survey, and she was actually there when I don't know if you heard about the the, the young girl that was attacked and killed by a leopard seal. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, and she was saying she was actually drowned this thing she said she was saying this, this she was a great great girl and everything and, but she was quite small and that's what i think and this this leopard seal grabbed her and go, took her down and uh, she said that uh, you know they 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 did get her back he did let her go but by then you know so but apparently i think i think she had a dive computer on but it, it had taken her down some some depth and i think it's it's very natural when you go you know that critical thinking these needed in an emergency, and I, you know, I, I've worked with the ambulance service and all sorts since 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 getting back from Thailand. It, it's not in most people, and I think you, you get you get organisations that feel that because we're in charge of this, then we are the best people to deal with this. And because it doesn't happen, they don't really prepare that well. I mean, when when we had the boats uh, in Samui, one of the things the first things we did when I ended up being in charge of the, 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 the boat master. One of the first things I did, I said, there's going to be a standby diver on the boat ready to go in at all times. And he he doesn't go diving. And everyone thought I was nuts. And I go, what are you talking about? You've got to take him in dance. No, we'll split up into the groups, do whatever the instruction, is, but there'll be a tally board there. Uh, and this standby diver, he's the safety guy. He's in, he's ready to do it. He, he logs people in and he logs them out. And and you know. And I remember one of a great guy, uh, uh, Paddy Adam, a uh, really good, good friend of mine. I think he still lives out there. <clears throat> he had just passed his dive master course and he was about to start work. And we said, first day, you're going to be the standby diver because we trained him through. Uh, you know, you're going to be in your kit. <clears throat> your kit's ready. Your air's on. You're in your wetsuit. You've got your mask there. Your fins are on the back. If someone needs you, you know, you've got all the rescue kit. But ultimately, you can get in the water very quickly. You know, and you, you, you've not been diving. So if, if you need to go down to the bottom and pick someone up, you can. Uh, and that was, the, you know, and I remember, you know, people sort of let, 
well, what are you doing this there? And I always remember his first day on that boat, he was in the water three times. First day, you know, pulled three people out of the water. And it was not uncommon for us to, to pull people out, out of the water, especially uh, Leicester Art, you, you get the what they call the boat boys on the bigger boats. And, and quite often they come from, you know, middle of Thailand, there is no sea, there's no water or nothing. And I always remember you, you get them on the boat and then the skipper would be a halfway between sort of the, the island of Costa Mi and Koh Phangan and you start talking to him. Like, you knew what he was saying. You know, can you swim? And this, you know, they always do the same thing. They just go, that's it. Just sort of half shake of the head. <laughs> and uh, the next thing you know, the, the, you know, the revs come off and he's going, and he just throw this kid in and you're like, oh my God, he's going to drown him, you know? And, and in the end, it's like, hey, he's trying to tell him how to swim. And in the end, it's, one of us has got to go and pull this guy out. He's forever grateful to you. But yeah, that, that happened more than once. But it's one of these things where people are very shocked. And I think you, you do get... Um, when you look at, you know, the, the psychology of it, there is this moment of, of, you know, unless it's it's trained and rammed into you, that you will have a shock where you won't do anything. Cognitive paralysis is the proper name for it. Where you're just going to sit there and you don't do anything. I think a lot of people do. They just can't believe this guy's just been thrown in. You know, yet the dive monsters are ready. Oh, he's done it again. In they go, sort of, you know, grab him. And of course, they, they're actually, by then, they're, they're quite proficient of, at pulling soggy people out of the water sort of thing uh, um you know so but it, it is one of those things where you do tend to see that people with the, all good intentions and all good ideas but they don't really prepare for it they don't practice for it they're not mentally ready for it they've just sort of like well you're in charge so you're in charge of an emergency and and that you know it, just because you're in charge that doesn't mean you're going to be any good at that uh, you know, and, and it was, you know, and I always remember that when they, they thought I was mad when they said, you, one of your dive masters staying on the boat and doesn't go in. No, that's the whole point of it. He, he is there to, to, to make sure everyone's in. And everyone, you know, but I think after a while, a lot of the guys, you know, did start seeing the benefits of it. And they said, all right, we guess your army, but army and whatever else. But it, it was, you know, they did start seeing when they saw the proof of the pudding, when, you know, a few of us had gone in because we were ready to move very quickly and pull people out. I think they saw the benefits of, of, of doing it that way, as it were, uh, and, and preparing proper, having not just writing down a plan. So there you go, there's an emergency plan, but actually going, let's practice this thing. Let's actually think this through uh, and put things in. I mean, we we used to have a tally board where we would actually log people in and out. And we go, right, what time are you going in? Oh, you're going in. And it's all the, 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 the guy on, on the bed. And it wasn't, you know, and the first thing he'd say was, how long are you going to be? And they go, you know, well, 45 minutes or whatever. And then you turn around and say, okay, we're going to give you an hour from the moment you step off the back deck and your time. Them. And we used to say, just remember, after an hour, you're not late, you're missing. And it was little things like that that made people, okay, go and enjoy yourself. But remember, that, you know, there's, there's because people do sort of worry about because especially there's nothing worse than losing your student. It's, oh, God heart go through the roof if you're bloody you know you, you, your student goes missing i remember taking a, a group down on on uh off kotel and it was a group of four and god knows why i've got it was getting a little bit choppy but we're on a little ledge and i'm doing some skills with them and i'm turning around to one and i remember we had to um was practicing a caesar controlled emergency uh, swimming ascent and he got a line i've tied the line off and it only goes up five meters so i've got a hold of this guy and he, he starts to go up and as he starts to go up out the corner of my eye, and as he, he went up, he, he choked on something. Or he, he choked on something, I couldn't remember what it was, but had to calm him down. And as I'm looking at him, out the, just literally off the side of my mask, I just saw to the, to the arch because it went like that. And as I turned my head, I was just seeing out the corner, this, the other student I had just slowly turning over, rolling to one side, and then just swam off and followed another group. And I've got this guy there, and I've got the other guy. Uh, who just couldn't control his buoyancy and I thought I just don't believe this is happening to me I've got a hold of two guys and this this third one just turned around and swam off and it, oh god you know it was one of the first times I was quite a new new instructor then but boy the dive and then I had to go up to people and say, lost one of these students horrible 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 feeling absolutely that horrible. must happen a lot Griff because I've been down there you know doing sports diving and when you get the two groups come together, yeah, there's a, there's a moment there where you don't realise it's two groups. You just think it's your group, and oh yeah, that, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, 
and yeah. suddenly if you look around and you can't see anyone from your group but you can still see these yeah. people it's yeah. quite tempting to be yeah. like well i don't want to be down here on my own i'm gonna fuck i'll just yeah weird yeah. isn't it it? It, 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 does, it does happen i think the key the key thing that happens quite a lot with with train divers you know you know as we said, we need the, the, the one in the Red Sea, the two groups of divers come past, you end up following the wrong group. Um, but speaking as an instructor, it, it, I just remember my heart was in my mouth and I just, you know, mm. you know, do I let these guys up and then go and grab him? No, it's probably not a good idea because one of them's choking, the other one's all over the place. Uh, and, and, and you sort of, oh my God, this is the, just the worst feeling in the world because don't forget, and, and I've had to explain this to diving doctors as well when they sort of go turn around and say, well, you know what, you shouldn't be diving with someone that's not trained. We're, we're diving instructors. That's all we dive with. We dive with people that aren't trained. That's the whole point of it. Um, but you you have these people, they're not trained divers, and all of a sudden he just swims off. You know, oh, my God. You know, it's it, it is a, it's a horrible feeling to, to have. It really is. The, it's just, And it's like, you know, and the guy just come back. Oh, I'd like, he had a great time. It thoroughly enjoyed it, you know. And I'm like, my God, I just want to go home and go to bed after this. It was terrible, you know, it was the worst, worst feeling ever. Um, you know, but it, 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 it happens um, and it's it, you just take it as a learning thing. I mean, that, that was very early on as an instructor, um, you know, and you, you take that ahead and, 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 and you learn more. Uh, you, you, you get better and you take it as a learning curve. Can we, yeah. Greg, can we just go back and talk about the tsunami again? Um, yeah. Because there were dive boats out, weren't there, with divers down in the water when this big wave came in? From what I, yeah, from what I understand, yeah, there, there, there was. From I mean, I suppose a lot of it is, is dependent on how far out you were and, 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 and whatever it is. Um, I did speak to one guy uh, a few years later uh, who was out there, um, and, and he sort of said... It was definitely, it was quite, no, it was seriously noticeable, you know, because he was underwater. He was like, you know, 10 metres, 20 metres, or well, 20 metres, 10 metres. How the hell did that happen, you know? And it was, what's going on here? And they were a bit sort of there, that. So, but I think generally, I think it probably wasn't as bad as for divers as I think as a lot of people probably thought it would be. Um, but, but, you know, again, you know, but it must have been information, I suppose. It must have been if they resurfaced and their dive boat had been smashed down, right? Oh yeah, well, look, I think I think the key thing is that is a lot of these, you know, how how far are because I know these things have to build up and they only become huge, don't they, when they're quite close to shore? Mm. Um, that's my understanding of, of, of these things. So from from what I I gathered from it, and you know, I may be wrong. From what I understood of it, a lot of the dive boats were further out at sea so in much deeper water and it does out of the two I mean one of the things that, you know you could say thank god is Andaman side the, the water is quite deep all right it's going to do it but in, on the Gulf of Thailand so it's actually shallow so like 60 meters deep um so you know you know and I that's what the, the guy we was talking about earlier that, that broke the world record uh, it's, it's since been broken for the deepest scuba dive. That's where he did it in the Andaman Sea. He got down a thousand feet uh, there. But if you look at the Gulf side, it's deepest point's about 60 meters, which is, you know, grand scheme of things, not a lot. But there were deeper bits there. I think you probably get, it would have been bigger on, on, on the Gulf side if it had been on that side uh, as opposed to that. But, you know, it, again, I think it's, it, it's one of those things where you, you end up, because you know people in that, you, you end up talking to them. So it's almost like uh, you're a bystander. And it's the best way to describe it. It's a horrible feeling, you know. You got, you know, you know. I'd literally just come over for, for Christmas and whatever else, and I was going back, and then, you know, I knew, you know, my time was was up. But I was literally just coming over for Christmas and then going back, sorting out my affairs and coming back. But it was a horrible feeling mm -hmm. uh, to be there when, when that that happened. You know, you had all your friends, but it was a really good community spirit pulled together there you know they all they all really pulled together from from what i understand and you know a lot of the guys living in in samui and whatever and, and kotal were planning to to tend over supplies and whatever else to to uh to thailand to to uh, uh phuket and and Kowlak and all that yeah yeah so just to clarify um 
Koh Samui, are we saying that's the Pacific side of the peninsula? Yeah, if you look at it, it's it's it's, it's um, a Gulf of Thailand side. It's it's Samui, so uh, you know you you, you it, uh, it's South China so, Sea going up that side. So they were um, all sheltered from the tsunami then. Yeah, because that's on the other side, so it, it, they didn't it didn't affect them. So because you know on the other side the Andaman Sea, because you know it's Indian Ocean, you know, whereas the Gulf of Thailand on the other side, it's a very small isthmus, isn't it? Uh, yeah, isthmus, isn't it? very small itself i mean you, you can drive across it in about three or four hours from one side of thailand to the other on that thinnest part um and my understanding is from what gary and the guys were saying on kotel they'd, they'd they'd all club together and started raising money and, and 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 the biggest thing they needed apparently was water fresh water mm. uh, so they were sending you know crates and crates of bottled water uh, across to, to the other side uh, at the time of it but um you, you know but it's you know being as it were, you know, you're just hearing all your, about your friends and you want to know, you know, is son's so okay, is son's so okay, he was over there, oh God, are they all okay? And, uh, you know, I remember speaking to Luba, the doctor, and when he, his story was just incredible. He said, you know, he went on to Cal Lack and he just said, which is full of bodies. And I, I remember saying to him, I said, how, how, how are you doing with that, buddy? How are you? Hey, oh no, and that's not a nice thing to see in typical Luber. He said, remarkably well, actually, Griff. And I was like, you know, yeah, he's, he's a great guy. And he just he he had the mindset that he could just function. Uh, and he and he did what was needed uh, at the time uh, over there. Um, great bunch of guys. It's, it's, uh, I mean, that's that's the key thing, is is you know, when you're living over there, you do overseas, you can see the nastier side of life. Uh, and the nastiest side of living, you know, idyllic tropical island. Um, Can we talk about that then? Because, yeah, um, you know, I'm well aware they call Koh Tao the deaf island, don't they? And there's all these rumours that there's the local <laughs> Koh Tao mafia that run the place. And yeah, I think that's everywhere. A kind of disproportionate amount of backpackers have died there, haven't they? Um, I mean, I, I would the first thing I would say is it's probably yes that there are. I know obviously we had the, the the murder a few years ago of a, of a couple of, of, of backpackers there. I think to be honest, we did see a lot of people uh, die, and, and one of the guys I worked with, Dave Covey, and I we helped out um, on a few bits and pieces and a few repats uh, as well, repatriations of, of mortal remains. Most of it though is it's accidents. It really is his accidents or, or, or even illness, but most of it, it's not the nastiest side. Um, I mean, there, there, there have been incidents of it and, 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 and stuff like that, but it's actually, most of it is, 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 is accidents. People, a very good friend, ex uh, RAF chap, um, uh, Bob Ward, we worked with him, but he died in structure there, awful, um, killed in a, a, a car crash. Um, you know, uh, and that was, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking, but it's it's what it is. You know, most people are, you know, it, it's accidents. And, and when when we we developed this injured diver evacuation service to, to serve the three islands, and we set it up, and we managed to get um, two local boats on board. We kitted them out, blue lights, everything. And they said, look, there'll always be one ready, no matter what. So if you need to, and it was literally just outside. We had the docks, we had the DMTs. We could over we go. But we also got in quite well with the Royal Thai Police and we got access to the helicopter at Suratani. And great bunch of guys, absolutely fantastic. And I, I always remember feeling a bit bad because you do live in these places, you think of you know corruption and everything else. And when they say, you know, you know, we can help you out, we can evacuate, right? How much do you want? What do you want? Well, nothing. It's our, it's our job to help you. And I, Felt a bit embarrassed that you know that I even sort of mentioned it, and these guys were fantastic. So we had the ability to to evacuate, and we set it up for for divers. Um, and and the reason we set up the helicopter one is because he said, look, you know, we can we can fly at, at very low level, and we can be there and back in sort of thirty minutes. Uh, and we were like, okay, we'll, we'll make use of that. And of course, because we could do that, most things are not diving related. So we used to end up evacuating a lot of people that were quite seriously ill or, or had had an accident. Um, Can you give uh, us some and, examples, Griff? Um, 
my guests tend to skirt the gory stuff and I think it's what people <laughs> probably be interested to I yeah, mean, I guess I'm guessing lots of motorcycle or scooter accidents. Yeah, that that was the worst one we had actually. It was was a, a motorcycle accident, and it's it's not just that. It's it's not wearing helmets, yeah. and and it's one of these things to give you a newfound understanding of why you have a helmet on. Um, uh, we we evacuate one guy. I remember we got the shout, and it's not something we normally do. And again, Lou was on the island with Gary, and we got the shout, and they said, "Look, can you come over?" We, it's, it's a mercy mission, as we said. So we were not, we we could, we had a fund in place to sort of, we'd, we could go over there and not charge anything, you know, hospitals would do whatever they did. Uh, and and um, basically, you know, these guys full on, he, he's driven his motorbike into a concrete well, face, face first into the concrete well. Um, so we said, okay, and then we'll get the helicopter. <laughs> We ring up and lo and behold, the, the, the guys say, it's being serviced right now. Like, oh, God. And, and I said, look, we'll crash out on the boat. That's the best thing we can do. So we've got a team, crash down the boat, you know, hour and 20 minutes, hour and something like that. We're on Kotal. And we got there. And then as, as we're there, you could see it, it was not a well guy. Um, he was quite seriously injured. It was some pretty horrific uh, head injuries that he had. Um, and as we got there, um, we, 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 I got the phone call because, you know, you, you get there, there's no phone reception, then you get to, to Kotal and there is phone reception. And that was when our secretary, we turned around and said, look, the helicopter is not ready, but the Air Force can come and get you. Um, and the thing we had is the doc was there saying, look, you know what, we, if we put him on that boat on the way back, he was really worried. It was so rough. He said, you know, with that sort of head injury, so it could, it could, it could kill him um and and so we, we managed to get the helicopter to come over uh, and, and pick us up and it's you know and this really was a you know the vietnam era era huey come in uh, and, and we sort of packed him up and then the guys you know kudos to these guys as well because these guys are you know we can do it as, as a, an exercise we'll do it and you know and, and they just came out they came out with a team and they'd <laughs> They, they'd taken these two seats in it, the old uh, um, Bell 212. It's not a human. I remember the guy said, no, it's not a human. It's a Bell 212. Uh, two sets of seats. And what they did is they'd taken one set of seats out and they'd the other set on this side. And there was three guys sat there. And one of them was a photographer because he wanted to take pictures of the first ever rescue these guys had done. Um, so, you know, he's sort of taking pictures of the helicopter landing Kotal. This helicopter's never been to Kotal. So it spent the time looking around, looking for the 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 the, the helipad, and and there isn't one. It's just like a clearing, and there's me sort of like, you know, you know, trying to march them in. And we managed to get this guy, in and we just loaded this guy up and, and and flew him back. And on the way back, we contacted the hospital on Samui, and and the trauma surgeon there said, look, send him straight, go straight to the mainland, and, and get him there. And um, I remember we dropped him off. Literally, a helicopter went straight in. We, we got to, to the trauma centre <coughs> at Suratani. The docs took him straight in. Um, uh, uh, and he, I think he went straight in to, to have surgery and we sort of left. But it was, you know, in the, the sad, sadly, a few days later, he, he, he did die. Um, but I always remember Gary, who the, the diabetic on Kota, who, who without doubt probably ended up being one of the most experienced diabetics in the world working there i think he did his dmt course in plymouth and then within the six months that he was there he'd used every single skill they'd taught him on that course oh for real it was you know so very experienced guy great guy and he said that the family had, had spoken to him and they, they'd come over uh, and they came over and saw gary i spoke to him on the phone they, they said you know look thanks for for everything you've done although we've lost him you know, you gave us the chance to, to actually say goodbye because from what the doctor's saying, he, he should never have survived the accident at all. So, you know, you, you look at it like that and you think, God, oh, you know, there by the grace of God go I um, uh, on this sort of thing. But you, you also look and go, I wasn't wearing a helmet, you know, you, stuff you, you just don't think of. And the other thing that you, you used to see as well is, is you, you forget that it's not free. Healthcare over there, even emergency healthcare, is not free. And the amount of times we used to treat divers, and they never had insurance. You know, oh my god. And and 
it, or, or you, you get people with we evacuate a guy he was just one of these people just see you know, just go home <laughs> go back to sweden i think he was from because we he was in a motorbike accident and we we evacuated him from Kotal, got him back and he was patched up in the hospital we sent him back and then about a month later we get the call seriously ill adult male uh, on Kotal, come and get him so we went up and got this guy and um the docs are saying you know he's got some sort of infection we don't know what it is and of course they got back and the guy was like the syruporn our internist saw him he says, he's got scrub typhus and we're like how the hell does he get something like that and he was just one of these things and you were looking at it, you know and you're like how lucky is he that he had insurance mm. um and so many others that you think about it he's, his mate didn't and, and his mate was saw both things happen and you're like well what if it had been you you know uh yeah. And you, you did see the, like say, the, the nastier side of life over there. Um, we did discuss that probably one of the saddest things we got involved with, and it was, it was by chance, but it was quite a horrific chance. There was a, a, a young Irish lad when he was over there was murdered. And he was actually murdered outside my front door. Um, and I got the phone call from now my wife, she's my girlfriend at the time, she said, can you... Can you pop back? Something terrible's happened. Um, there's a there's a dead Farang, a dead foreigner, uh, in our house. So that can't be. What do you mean in our house? She said, just just come home. And I was like, I said, it's probably an accident just outside on the road. And she's seen something like that. And I I, I got there, and there's already a, uh, the the police van there. And you know, it's not like you see it over in the UK where it's sealed off for miles. And I literally walked all the way up to my house and crying out loud. There's this poor guy laying on my step on the front step of my house and I'm looking down at oh my and there's blood everywhere claret all over the place and you could see this guy his throat had been seriously cut it was a horrific wound uh, and you could see he was gone um mm. and we were there and the police are sort of there and I'm like this is surreal you know by rights the police are going should be going, get on your bike son you know with you know we just had a murder and I said, can I come see me? Why? Yes, yeah. so I just walked around this, this poor chap and, and got in the out, how to see her. I said, let's get out the back. We got out the back, walked around the front, and then the pandemonium went, went crazy. Um, and the guy that killed him walked out of the jungle. And they said, that's it. So the police just grabbed him, put him in the back of the truck. And I could see he was a Westerner. Uh, and I, you know, because we work with the embassies and whatever else, I thought, you know what, we'll. We'll do our normal bit and we work with Dave Covey and, and we heard he was, you could hear in his voice he was a Brit. Um, and I said, so, so what's your name? And I still remember his name. His name was Robert South. We said, where are you from? And he went to South End in Essex. And I thought, was, oh my God, he lives about eight miles from where I come from. Um, and uh, after that, they took him away and, and it was a, just very bizarre. Of course, the, the guy that was killed, his two friends were there, just numb. And it was going back to this, you know, they're not cut out for this. But, you know, I said, you know, we'll sort it out. So I, you know, I, I the, the police arranged for, for this chap to be taken to the, to the NATO hospital and whatever else. And they're going, well, now what do we do? So I said, well, we need to contact them. So I ended up chasing down the embassy and that. And the, the thing was, is there was no Irish embassy in, in there's no Irish embassy in Thailand. Uh, and I don't think there was one in Malaysia, but there was an honorary consul in Malaysia. I remember speaking to him uh, and then, because we deal with insurances, we spoke with, we managed to track down this guy's insurance and got his remains repatriated back to, to, to Ireland. And I remember just after doing it, I got a phone call and it was his aunt just sort of thanking us for, for, for doing what we did because the other two lads were completely, uh, uh, you know, no, you're not going to, you fancy seeing that. That's going to live with you for, you know, lives with me to this day. I think something horrific like that. God knows what they think. They're, they're why, why did the lad uh why did the lad kill him did did you ever find out um my understanding was and I think if i'm honest I think if you if you look it up it's in it's in the newspapers and whatever else uh you know historically uh but it, it was over i think it was over a, a girl he'd had an argument over a girl and this guy took a well obviously a, a severe dislike, dislike into but it was literally like a bit of a lover's tiff 
but it was you know to to end like that was 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 horrific and you, and you sit there going do you, do you have any idea what, where you're going to be for the rest of what could be your short life because at the time thailand still still has the death penalty but at the time then the method of execution was firing squad so people were sort of saying you know that they might pull him up against the wall and shoot him for this one um, and you can't really just you think of all the pain you have put everyone through your own family you are going to suffer this poor guy you 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 murdered and he did do it you know, when he was he did it he knew he did it he said he did it in the back of the truck um it, wow for, for what you know and there was no you could not say that it was in any way you looked at this guy there's no way i could tell us here that it was self-defense it was a, it was a proper like an assassination you just by the wound one wound straight across his throat uh, and you can see how deep it was uh horrific and you're like, for what you you, you you know lunatic and what and i you know i remember him sitting in the back of the police truck sort of smirking and and you know all the crowd are going around i remember one of them because he's handcuffed one of these guys is turning around and sort of you know jokingly feeding pouring coke down his face and he's like eh, thanks a lot mate and all this he's like jesus you you have you know what you know, i think he was in shock himself you know you realize what you've done son you know it's all over for you mate um so so yeah but we did that that as a the repat and did you ever find yeah. out what happened to him is it I mean he's... <laughs> I've, I've tried to find i, I don't but I, I do believe he, i don't think they did get past the death sentence on him or anything like that i what you know, outside of that, I, I don't know. I know he got uh, a quite a significant prison sentence, um, but outside of that, I couldn't tell you. I wouldn't know. Um, it, Chris, uh, going back to the um, the decompression chamber. Yeah. So I guess we should do th two things. We should explain to people that are listening what, what the Benz is and why it's so dangerous yeah. and how you get it. And then could you expand upon... <clears throat> like how many people like say a month you yeah, have to deal yeah. with and, and how did they get into that situation yeah um well first of all for those that don't understand what decompression sickness or decompression illness or the bends is um it is the build-up of bubbles in the blood and tissues that actually cause damage by being blocking blood flow and damaging uh nerves and whatever else and dependent where these bubbles get trapped is dependent on how severe it is the best way to describe what it is from a, a physics perspective is if you open up a bottle of coke or something like that and you see all the bubbles that that's basically what decompression is sickness is, is doing to yourself the key thing that we say is is that believe it or not most divers that come up will have bubbles but we call them silent bubbles because they don't actually do any harm. Um, but every now and again, you know, some people, the, the bubbles will get stuck and that's when you get symptoms. And if I'm honest, the vast, vast majority of the divers we saw, their symptoms were relatively mild. But because we had quite over there, we, Phuket did about 60 per year. Um, we did about 50 a year at the time, which, which is actually quite high uh, for a lot of places. But not only that, we had some of the worst cases uh, of decompression. We would quite happily, we, I remember the two worst we'd treated was in the space of, of one week. Uh, and we ended up with doctors all over the world wanting to know how we, we did this because um, they, they'd both come to the survey. They basically done the worst thing in diving that you can do, held their breath, came straight up um, and, and Due to the physics, the, the, the lungs uh, expanded. They got a pulmonary barotrauma, as it's called. Blood, uh, these gas bubbles were forced into arterial blood and they basically got an air bubble in, in, in their brain. Uh, and that happened twice in, in one week. Uh, and, and both people uh, arrested. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we got one of the guys, I, I remember he was brought back on the boat by one of the diving instructors I know, he lives in Plymouth now. Uh, brought him back, uh, you know, uh, healing hands, Alan. Um, yeah, he 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 he's, uh, did his CPR and, and managed to bring him back. 
Um, and, and we got these guys in the chamber and I remember sitting in that chamber for six and a half hours bagging this guy. <laughs> We'd rigged up the, uh, 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 an ambu bag, the old bag you see them when they're resuscitated, we rigged up that with, with oxygen going in through our chamber system and, and on, we plonked it onto what's known as an endotracheal tube and between myself and the doctor we bagged him for six and a half hours, seven hours I think, we extended to table six. Um, but yeah, we, we bagged him for, for that long um, and, and he got quite a few treatments. But, but that's the worst case. Most are sort of numb, tingly fingers, but you also get the cases that's in between where they come up and, and they can't walk, they can't move or they can't feel. Um, they say statistically, they say it's around one, one in 7,000. Um, and yeah, I'd say it's probably around right. But again, you know, how accurate is that? Who knows? So um, are these people that, for whatever reason, have not done the correct decompression stops on their way back up? No. Do you know what most of them did wrong? Nothing. Most people, you'll find, that actually do get decompression sickness, we saw. A lot of it was factors more akin to dehydrated and they've gone diving. Um, which is a common one. We used to actually see when you had the full moon party on Copang Gang, we used to see an influx the next day because they go and do the full moon party, then go diving and then come and see us. Uh, but no, most of the people that got decompression sickness, there was they, they didn't do what we call the traditional violations. They did not, uh, you know, uh, come up too quick. They didn't hold their their, their breath they didn't um go beyond limits or anything like that it just you know and and you know as uh, met some great doctors and i always remember uh, a, a doctor a fantastic doctor real mentor for us out there a chap one named klaus torp from the u.s dr klaus torp and i always remember he's put it succinctly he says there's only two ways you can guarantee never get in decompression illness or the bends the first one is don't go diving. The second one is if you do go diving, don't ever come up. And I thought, that's, yeah, that's because that's pretty much how, how you get it. You don't get it when you're down. You get it on the way up for, for the vast majority of, mm. of, 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 of reasons uh, there. But, yeah, I'd say majority of people that got it, it wasn't because they did anything wrong. And that even went over when I came up over, again, did it in the UK for, for, for many years afterwards in, in London. Um, and I think that was pretty, pretty similar as well. Most people didn't actually do anything wrong per se. Um, you know, it was more probably been a bit too, too much drinking or something like that. But in the UK, a lot of it as well was they maybe got on a flight a bit too quick and flew home, uh, which doesn't do you, do you any good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I was going to so say that, the alcohol thing, because it's a funny thing, isn't it? That, it's a sport where you'd think drinking drugs should be like a long way away from it. And, and it, and it yeah. should be, you know, let's be honest, yeah. but, but because of the party lifestyle where these dive resorts oh, yeah. are, I, mean, I, I went down with a guy in South Africa. I think it was actually in Mozambique, yeah. um, somewhere around Maputo. And, and yeah. I, saw, I saw his dive shop on the beach and said, oh, can we go out? And he's like, yeah, have you, you know, what experience have you got? I said, I'm BZAC level one. Yeah. Had I dived anywhere else in the world at that stage? I don't, don't think I had, but uh, anyway. Um, and I remember him just like, he puts his beard down. He's like, right, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. And, yeah. I have no doubt he sat on that beach all day drinking beer and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, judging it. I reckon you probably get so used to that lifestyle yeah. that taking a tourist out diving is, is nothing. But it was, but yeah, I think, I think that's some of the thing is, is we used to see it. And, and I remember sometimes we, you get, I think the problem that we had sometimes was, you know, and, and I empathize with them as an instructor. If, if your student got bent, it was awful. Uh, and, you know, I, I was lucky my students never get bent, but, you know, you spent a lot of time just saying, look, this is not your fault. Just because he got bent doesn't mean you did something wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of times, you, you, you know, we'd turn around and the other thing that did happen, you, you'd turn around, of course, when they go and do this diving, I mean, when you and I learned to dive, you know, right, 
well, learn to dive, great. Diving medical officer, full medical. You know, that was what, what it was. Um, but when, you know, when you learn to dive through through Paddy, and it's, it, I know, I know the Puritans and that, oh, Paddy, put another dollar in this and that, but I'll be honest with you, it is a good system. It is a good system to learn that it teaches you what you need to know, and it doesn't worry about the stuff you don't need to know. You can learn that later on. It really is a good system. They really know how to teach you. I mean, I, my instructor development course was one of the best courses I've ever done. I learned so much on how to teach. Um, you know, so it is a good system, and and because it's a good system, when your your, your student or, or one of your divers gets bent, you do feel this a severe guilt that oh god what have i done here this is have i done something wrong and it goes back to you don't have to do anything wrong and a lot of it is to do with the guys themselves you know they're on holiday they've just got here they have party up the night before you know and, and some of them literally you know finished drinking this back when i i was there it, it when i first got over to thailand the, the bars were 24 hours or you could find 24 hours to drink um but you know, so they go out and drink and literally put the beer down, go on the boat, mm. which is, it's not a problem to a degree, but it's when you start coming in with a hangover because you're dehydrated. And if you're dehydrated, that's not a good, you know, that's, that's, that's beyond anything else. That was the main reason people got, yeah. got, got hit uh, quite bad. Um, but, you know, the, the, one of the worst we had that wasn't fatal, which is a par paralysis, uh, was a, a, a Canadian guy who was diving off Kotal. He was on his advanced course, and he had just finished the deep dive, which is, it's not hugely deep. It's 30 metres, 100 feet. But he literally goes down, he looks at some cards. Here's a balloon. We're going to let it go. His, his colour changes and whatever else. He came up and he said, no, my, my fingers are tingling. They feel a bit odd. And, you know, by the time they got him to shore, he said, my all my legs are now numb and tingling. By the time Gary saw him, he said he's, you know, he's he's starting to lose it on his legs. He's losing power on his legs. And there's a way we test the power in your legs and the strength in your legs as a method of how, you know, if you become paralyzed. By the time we got him to, to Samu, he, he couldn't move from the chest down. And, you know, you're sitting there, he's going, 25, 26, and he's, he's saying, OK, getting a little, and I remember his words, I'm, I'm getting a little concerned now. I mean, am I ever going to walk again? And it's a horrible thing when someone asks you that and you're like, oh, well, you know, and you think, I can't ask the doc because the doc will just, he won't break it to him easy at all. Uh, so I remember just saying, well, give us a chance. We haven't treated you yet. Um, but the other thing as well, the fantastic thing when you do treat these people is how quickly they can get better. And he was quite lucky because I think we did, you know, by the time he left us and we, he did get a lot of treatments with him with us every day for about I don't know, week, two weeks, something like that. By the time he finished, he was walking again. Um, and I think he, he had a bit of a walking stick, but I, for, a few, for a while afterwards, he kept sending us sort of thanks notes and, and letters and that. And, and it was really nice to, he said, this is me skiing. And we were, you know you've done something right if the guys got back to skiing he said oh limp's gone i jog in the morning and everything else and it was like whew, you know he's he's good he's good which which is the the, the good thing of it but um yeah you, you can see that the, the nastier side of it it's uh and the, the downside as well is when you're working with diving doctors um of course a diving doctor the only time they see a diver is is one that's got the bends so as far as they're concerned, it's, it's the most dangerous sport out there. And you're like, you, you've got to realise, you've got to put it in a context, you know, for, for every one you see, there's about, you know, there's nearly 10,000 out there. Nothing's happened to. Yeah. Um, you know, so, yeah. So. Well, Griff, to, to, to finish up our chat, what did you have any connection to the, the cave rescue, the children that got stuck in the cave? Um... The only, not no not not technically the only I, I can tell you what we did do when it did did happen I mean I think everyone in his dog was was wanted to get on I mean you know Elon Musk wanted to send his special chamber thing out there um, and and I remember I know I, I know the guys 
uh, 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 there's a company called SOS into uh, uh, SOS Hyperlite, and they actually build a portable hyperbaric chamber. And it's designed, it's, you, you literally, you, it's inflatable. Uh, you, it comes in a couple of boxes and some backpacks and it's using scuba tanks to, to, to fill out. And I remember speaking to Paul Selby, the, the owner of the company, I said, you know, it might be worthwhile seeing if you guys could, could ship something out there. And I think he, he might have sort of tried to see it, but I think by then every man and his dog was, was trying to, to help out, I think, uh, on that job. And in reality, what they needed was what they had already out there with some really high-end experienced cave divers. Um, and I know one of the guys that worked with us in, in Phuket, uh, uh, really experienced technical and cave diver called Ben Remnants. I know he went out there and, and, and helped out, out with it. But, mm. And I think it was, it was more, the, the support we were sort of looking at, it was more to do with if something went wrong and you needed to treat someone, if you had that facility there, you could start treating because you can actually the thing is designed you can put something in it and pick it up like a stretcher it's actually called a hyperbaric stretcher um you know and that's it's that is just bordering on miraculous uh, that they got them all um, i mean they lost a, a thai special yeah, di a diver was killed a, di a diver died uh, as part of that but uh, again it's 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 one of these things that you know you, you had a, a yeah there is the only people that can do that were the people that did it mm. these these high-end cave diver now it, it's a real it, it's one of these things i personally would do cave diving it, it's not my thing but i have the utmost respect for them because it's you know you literally are squeezing into little holes at extremely deep depth and the sort of things that you've got to do all decompression for i think it's probably the most hazardous form of diving i can think of you know, yeah. you know if I'm honest with you, if, if I, I would say it's probably you're in more danger cave diving than you are clearance diving, and that's getting rid of unexploded bombs and that. I, I really do think that. I think it's probably more dangerous. But absolute respect to them. It was, it was, you know, a real un, unbelievable uh, story. And my understanding is they're they're looking to make a movie. I, mean, I suppose it how only natural. I suppose they're going to do that, but. Uh, I remember seeing one news clip and a doctor had prescribed them all, I think, a Valium tablet for the, you know, yeah. for their I think, I think, Yeah. I mean, it was interesting because obviously we were, you know, at the time it sort of all happened and you're like looking at it and I, I literally, I just finished working at, at the chamber. I still knew Paul and I still knew a few doctors in the game. And, and, and I think a few of them were saying, you know, it really is, it's, it's uncharted. Whatever, whatever they did, I think there was very few people that could really turn around and go, look, you know what, it, it, it was the wrong thing to do. Um, you know, you, you would never in a million years dream of, of sedating someone that's, you think about what they're doing. Mm. You're sedating a child. You're then going to put them in breathing apparatus they've never used before to do some of the hazardous type of diving that there ever is. Oh, by the way, we're going to make you all sedated so you're half asleep. It's just, it's just an insane concept. But, you know, these guys and the, the doctor that was over there was not just a diving doctor. He was a cave diver himself and a very experienced one from my understanding. So the key thing with things like that was, you know, it was a it was a calculated risk that at the end of the day, they had to do it. They couldn't live there for, for forever. Um, and it was one that, that, that paid off um, a lot of unsung heroes uh, at, at, at that. And it's I think it's it really was a, a community that came together uh, to, to pull that off. And there is, a, you know, obviously the, the two guys that actually got there, um, but, you know, they didn't get there on their own. There was a, a huge support element. I believe the US Air Force sent uh, para rescue teams there. Uh, the, the, the cave diving community, I think they descended sort of on mass. I mean, it's not a huge community, but they're all up there doing their bit and I think it was it really was a, a team effort and when you've got that that sort of experience I think that's probably what made people think, you know if anyone's going to do it we can you know with the there was no point in in sort of shall we get this guy and that guy they were already there the, the right people were already there at the time to do it um, gosh the sense of relief just must have been god yeah oh my god because the other side of the fence doesn't bear thinking about does it yeah, yeah, I, I, it's, it's 
kind of similar in it in a way. Did you remember the, the miners in Chile? Mm. He sort of had sort of that sort of vibe about it, didn't it, sort of thing. But I, I just always remember it from from the, the the fact of the, you know, it's just sad it got a bit bit political in a way with with I know Elon Musk sent over, you know, uh, or he was going to send over something. I think it sounded like wires got crossed for whatever reason, and and you know someone's taken offence to the fact that they didn't want their kit and whatever else. But you know, it was it was one of these things that you know. It, it was an amazing achievement it really was uh, you know unbelievable and griff I, I should ask you what what do you do now what what what, what are you doing in the uk have, have um you, you well I, I i when i got back from thailand i actually got back into doing the hyperbarics and i worked at, in, in the hyperbaric chamber in london for a few years uh and um and, and i ended up doing quite a few bits there and i ended up diversifying out of not just decompression, it was end up working with things like carbon monoxide poisoning. And I worked with the um, uh, fantastic and unbelievably professional group of people. And when I say work, I mean in the loosest term, I, I sort of did a couple of lessons for them, lectures for them. Uh, the hazardous area response team for the ambulance service, fantastic bunch of guys. And these are the guys that they were set up after um, uh, the the 7 7 bombings to, to be able to go into what's known as the hot zone. So any hazardous area, they're all trained to do it to, to an incredibly high level. And one of the things they were doing was they were dealing with people with carbon monoxide poisoning. So we ended up working with those for a bit. Um, and that was all with, with the chamber. And then part of my duties in the chamber through diving and what I'd done there, I got into safety. Uh, and now I'm a safety consultant. So yeah, doing various bits and pieces, uh, still do the diving and, and still consult in, in diving and, and diving safety uh, and whatever it's just on the just purely on the safety side now really do you want to give any sort of contact details or is i mean are you looking for like business or is that not are we just here for uh, a chat is what i'm saying yeah we're just here for a chat mate you know uh, you know couple couple of couple of <laughs> X, X squaddies and booties, just uh, you know, pull up a sandbag, string a lantern, and uh, you know, that's all it's about, isn't it? <laughs> well, you could have writ written a quick book in the last week since we spoke, and then uh, done it, mate. We Believe it or not, we could promote your book now. <laughs> done it already. Have you uh, written one? I, it was an itch that I had to scratch. I, I wrote it years ago. You can probably find it. It's called A Simple Guide to Decompression Illness. Um, I've read a couple other books um, uh, for, for, for hyperbaric training manuals and stuff like that, but I, I just, when I was in Thailand, I always remember there's just too many people didn't know about this, that even at the higher end, they thought they did. Um, and I, I, you know, and it, some of it got quite sort of hairy when, you know, you, you were treating a guy and, and the instructor comes out and he wants to knock your lights out. How dare you say that my diver's bent? And he is. He's got he's got the bends, he's, don't worry about it, we're going to treat him, he'll be fine. Mm. And they took it really personally. It was like, how could he? Look at his dive computer, he's not done anything wrong. And you're like, okay, here we go, I've got to do this lesson now. Um, so I just went, you know what, I really want to do it. And I, I just put together a, a, a bit of a book and I got it reviewed by uh, a, a couple of really great guys. One is uh, the head of something called the Divers Alert Network in, in Australia, uh, a guy called John Lippmann and uh, a doctor called Klaus Torp. The, the American guy we spoke to before, uh, they they sort of went through it. So yeah, it, it's pretty good. And I, I got back to the UK, approached the publisher, and he said, "Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll publish it." So mm -hmm. it was more an itch that needed to be scratched. Because I, I remember saying to him, "I said, look, you know what? Whatever your money you make, I mean, give it a help for heroes or something like that." Um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> I'm not going to be a millionaire out of it. So yeah, Griff, listen, this has been a fascinating chat. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, yeah, all, all good, mate. All good. Yeah, thanks for yeah giving us your story and um, yeah, no, all, all, you know it's always always good to chat to a fellow ex servicemen. So yeah, always yeah, good, mate. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And to everybody at home, much love to you all. Please look after yourselves. If you can like and subscribe, that would really help the channel. And see you next time.